So making every count, making every contact count alcohol and pregnancy, I suppose, I think when it comes to alcohol and pregnancy and dealing with the pregnant woman who is taking a drink, that that's the sole remit of the GP, the midwife, the obstetrician, the maternity services. That's for, for the people who look after pregnant women in Ireland, I think is their sole remit. Alcohol use during pregnancy is a clinical issue. It would involve an individual risk assessment for the mother involved and you know, tailored services to her need. It has been said to be by a consultant obstetrician that by the time the woman gets to us, it's too late. Well, it's never too late to stop drinking during pregnancy because the brain continues to develop throughout pregnancy. But by the time they get to the obstetric service, it is too late for an alcohol-free pregnancy. And if we want to have a pregnancy that's free of the risk of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, it has to be an alcohol-free pregnancy. Safe limiting a pregnancy? There's no such thing. I know that somebody referred to the, we said the debate last week about new um, publication. I think that's the BMJ open one. And of course, the headlines that was carried in the papers was that, you know, little evidence of harm uh, from low dose alcohol use in pregnancy. Now, what they had done there is they had done a systematic review and a meta analysis of any of the inf evidence they could find internationally on alcohol classified as less than 32 gram a week, which is one or two eight gram drinks once or twice a week. And what they found was that there was so little data available, it couldn't be assessed. So the fact that there was so little data available, that was carried then as little evidence of harm. It was an absence of evidence you know, was what was there, not evidence of absence. So we have to be very careful, uh, you know, about what's coming out because what's given as the headline might not reflect what's actually in the substance of the report. So for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, alcohol is causal. There's no amount of alcohol that's absolutely safe and there's no amount of alcohol that's absolutely dangerous within pregnancy. It's a relative risk of harm, but the risk is very high. There are multiple mechanisms, direct and indirect, and I'll just go into those now. So if you could move on a little bit. So when it comes to um, prenatal alcohol exposure and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, the placenta is no barrier to alcohol. Alcohol is one of those unusual substances. It is both lipid and uh, water soluble, and it freely crosses the placenta. So the level of alcohol that the woman achieves in her own bloodstream, that's mirrored in the unborn child. Then from about, so there's a complete pathway of exposure. Then from about the age of 14 weeks, the fetus swallows the amnion and excretes it. That actually gives a recycle of exposure. As you know, we really, most of our alcohol is broken down by the liver, but we do excrete some alcohol in our lungs and we excrete some alcohol in our urine unchanged by simple diffusion. Now it's only, when it comes to urine excretion of it, it's only about 5% of the alcohol that we take in. But at the same time, the amnion should be a pure substance. It shouldn't be contaminated. So if you are drinking alcohol, there will be alcohol in your baby's amnion. It's the social norm to drink, including drinking when pregnant in Ireland. We know that if you do a survey of the population aged over 15 in Ireland, about 80% of them drink. We now know from the study that was done in Cork where they would have followed 1,000 first-time pregnant women during their pregnancy, and as the pregnancy was going along, they would have determined their alcohol intake, that 82% of the women drank at some stage during their pregnancy, 45% would have binge drank during their pregnancy. Next slide. The rate of breakdown of alcohol varies. There's a genetic component to the risk. There are four different gene alleles within a woman that govern whether she's quick or fast at breaking down her alcohol. The rate of breakdown of alcohol can vary between women by a factor of eight. So that's a genetic component that none of us really know whether we're quick or slow at breaking it down. The metabolism of alcohol then has a number of factors that would affect it. The speed of intake, we all know this even for when we go out and have a drink ourselves. You know, how much we drink, how quickly we drink, whether we've eaten before we go out, how we're feeling, you know, whether we're very tired or whether we're, we'd say, well in ourselves. Um, or body composition, if you're more lean, you take the alcohol out of your blood more quickly than if you have more adipose tissue. We can go on from that as well. 
This is a picture from the same National Geographic that I took the other photo from, and I have George Steinmetz's permission to use for educational purposes. This shows fraternal twins. So basically, they're not genetically the same, but they were in the same pregnancy with the same, you would say, exposure to prenatal alcohol exposure. Yet one of them has full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome and the other has, is much less affected with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I mean, we know it's a fact, even if you have identical twins, they're not going to be born with identical weight. So there are so many factors that impact how the prenatal alcohol exposure actually acts on the fetus. It's no wonder we have different outcome. And I suppose that's an explanation for why you have so much, um, I suppose, conflicting advice, because there is differing outcome between women. But there's an explanation, a scientific explanation, why that can occur. So then when you look at causal criteria, you know, is alcohol, you know, the cause of fetal alcohol syndrome, the cause of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? Well, the criteria that had to be met to prove cause are set, back, set out back in the 1960s. You have to have evidence from two experiments in humans. Well, we're never going to have a randomised controlled trial of pregnant women. We're never going to feed some of them alcohol and leave some of them without alcohol and see the difference because we know it's harmful. Is the association strong? Is it consistent from study to study? Well, it is seen in all races, all socioeconomic groups and everywhere it has been looked at. So the, consist the, the association is very strong. Is there a temporal relationship? Does the cause precede the effect? Well, it does. To have fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, you have to have had exposure to prenatal alcohol exposure. Is there a dose response gradient? Yes. The more you drink, the higher your risk. The less you drink, the less the risk that the baby will be affected. Does the association make epidemiological sense? It does. As women are drinking more in society, we are seeing more of it. Does it make biological sense? Um, it does make biological sense. We have known from years that we say drinking, even we say at adolescence and in early 20s, can affect the developing brain. And that all those evidences is widely published. Is the association specific? And I suppose this really is probably the strongest cause of criteria that is met. We know there's a condition called fetal alcohol syndrome, the only known cause of which is prenatal alcohol exposure. There's no other cause of it. And then is the association analogous to a previously proven causal relationship? Well, it is. I suppose we know since the thalidomide tragedy that you know, substances taken by the mother can have an impact on the fetus. So basically, you know, it meets all the causal criteria. We know we have the complete pathway of exposure. I think we can be very sure that prenatal alcohol exposure has an adverse impact on the developing brain of the fetus. And as was already mentioned as well in presentations, alcohol, we've known that it is a teratogen and um, causing birth defects. That was published by the Institute of Medicine in the, in the States in 1996. Sorry. Sorry. We should be on the international evidence now. It's just gone wonky. Sorry yeah. enough. Yeah. That's it, the international evidence is what you want the next one. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's now, as uh, Moira pointed out, it's now included under conditions that need further examination under DSM 5. And I suppose the whole thing is this you know, is absence of evidence, evidence of absence is not. Do we wait on the evidence or do we apply the precautionary principle now? the next one. So there's been, our evidence I suppose has been contributed significantly this year. There was the Lancet article in, June, in January which they had a further publication of their results in August and then this BMJ that was uh, released very recently. And having done a systematic review and a meta-analysis of all the data on the occurrence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in populations and what is known about prenatal alcohol intake in the populations they have established that the risk is one in 67. It only takes 67 women to drink during pregnancy for one child with fetal alcohol syndrome to be born. And then that's noting that's a, a ratio which has been established internationally that for every one child with fetal alcohol syndrome, you'd have nine or 10 children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So that would be an average risk, one in 67, which in medical terms is a very high risk. If you drink more, 
the risk is greater. If you drink less, the risk is less. This is the average risk. Ireland featured, unfortunately, as one of the five countries with the highest prevalence of fetal alcohol syndrome. And you can estimate from the information provided in those studies that about 600 Irish babies are born a year with fetal alcohol syndrome and over 40,000 Irish persons are living with fetal alcohol syndrome. That's fetal alcohol syndrome now, not FASD. You could multiply by 9 or 10 to arrive at the FASD. This low alcohol, as I said, um, 32 grams per week, that was the most recent article. What they concluded is that they felt that there was sufficient evidence that we should be applying the precautionary principle and renewing our guidance that there should be no alcohol during pregnancy. So then, what's the evidence in Ireland at the moment? Well, the evidence would indicate that four in five of first pregnancies are exposed to alcohol, and nearly one in two, 45%, are exposed to high-risk levels of alcohol use in pregnancy. That two in five pregnancies are unplanned, increasing the chance they'll be exposed to alcohol. That pregnant women do not consistently receive timely maternity care or support for their alcohol and drug issues. That health professionals do not consistently provide information on the risks of drinking during pregnancy or routinely screen for alcohol issues. That most clinicians lack the capability to diagnose fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. That families of people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders struggle to access appropriate support and they report a lack of understanding from services, professionals and even other family members. In New Zealand, they found the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder affects about 50% of the children and young people that they have in child, youth and family care. We can go on to the next uh, slide. Yeah, you have it here. No, no, the other one, I suppose. I've just put up the invisible characteristics of FASD and I just want to say one thing. I think every man, woman and child in Ireland knows somebody with the invisible characteristics of FASD. And we're talking about our own mothers, our own sisters, our own neighbours, our workmates, our, you know, our colleagues, our friends, having a child with the invisible characteristics of FASD. So what, this is really the, the elephant in the room, right? To what extent is ASD a manifestation of FASD? There's only one multidisciplinary clinic in the UK that diagnoses FAS and FASD. It's outside London and his Dr. Raja Mukherjee um, runs that clinic. And he would say that of the children he sees for the assessment of FASD, 49% of them have a prior diagnosis of ASD. And then, this was already raised in a previous um, talk, the FASD diagnosis requires documented prenatal alcohol exposure and this limits ascertainment. And then I suppose what I want to put out to the audience as well is, do we actually need a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder diagnosis? Is there any benefit to the child or to the mother in reaching a diagnosis of FASD? If the child has an alternative diagnosis, that gives the child access to the services that child needs. Do we need to document prenatal alcohol exposure for health promotion? There are metabolites of alcohol, ethyl glucuronide is one of them, that if you have been drinking within the previous five days, it will show up in your urine. At a routine antenatal check, should we be checking the urine for a metabolite of alcohol? Just to be able to tell the mother that there is evidence you know, of alcohol in your system that could affect the baby. Just as an additional. Now, that would be a screening service. We need to examine that in a lot of detail before we think of going down that avenue. But it's just something to put out there. We do really need the pregnant pause that we have an alcohol-free pregnancy. I'll just tell you an anecdote. I have a child with special needs myself. I was at a local disability service transformation, local implementation group. There were seven of us present. Um, there's myself, we'll say, child, mother, I, my child has cerebral palsy, a child with Down syndrome, a child with another syndrome, and then there were four who had children on the um, autism spectrum disorder, and they were just making the point that our local service provider in North Cork, the Charleville Association for the Handicapped, had uh, 400, had 650 children on his books, am I getting it right now? And for 450 of those were on the autism spectrum disorder spectrum. So it's actually a massive problem. It's two thirds of our um, clients attending the intellectual disability services. 
So then I think it's important that um, I bring this to your attention. Right? This is from the Washington Post of January 2016 and it features the daughter of Cathy Mitchell. Now Cathy Mitchell set up the National Organization for Fetal Alcohol Syndrome in the States and for the last 40 years she has worked tirelessly to try to raise this as an issue and try to help women to have an alcohol free pregnancy. But she was approached by a journalist who said, do you mind if I come out and take a photo of your daughter who's now aged 43, who was born with fetal alcohol syndrome? And she said, no problem. And she said, she, I suppose she didn't, she said she didn't think it would have such a, a spread or whatever. But anyway, there was a page and a half spread done in the Washington Post on her daughter. And it was read over the following week by an unprecedented, some, something like 7.7 .7 million hits. And there were 823,000 comments left, totally unprecedented. And as she said, the comments were all driven by hate. Now she said, you know, she tries to avoid them. She said, very difficult, you know, she has other children, very difficult for herself, her family, her friends. And you know, it was made, the point was made already, this is a very sensitive topic. You know, it isn't the woman has harmed her baby, it's the alcohol. No woman sets out to harm their baby. I mean, um, Mally was just saying there, even when she was pregnant four years ago, she didn't have this information being given to her. I have my own children, I can't say I didn't drink during pregnancy. I never understood it either when I had my children. Um, sorry. So the prevention then of fetal alcohol spectrum disease, it's all our business. The alcohol fee pregnancy <laughs> work starts in schools. And we're trying to give input into the junior start and the senior start curriculum on SPHE. We can use, we can learn from lessons learned internationally. It requires a whole of government and a whole of society response because you're changing a social norm and we need the government to implement the public health alcohol bill. Let's face it, they need to be behind this too. Effective interventions, screening and brief intervention outside of pregnancy is shown to be effective. Um, effective interventions that are being adopted in North America really are the Parent Child Assistance Programme. Um, what should the Regional Drug and Alcohol Task Forces do? Well, I think their role, and I've spoken to this already, is to work on the societal factor, and that's a very big task. So all your work to date refers. We need to change the social norm. We need to start the conversation. There needs to be a consistent message. And individually then, within our own lives, we need to lead by example. It's a major challenge, but we have seen in Ireland, you know, this thing about, you know, you know, don't have the fifth um, pint before you drink. You know, Mothers Against Drink Driving really changed the social norm, and it is now really socially it's unacceptable to drink and drive. So we can do the same on this issue. An alcohol-free pregnancy, well, we're not asking women to stop drinking, but we are trying to enable women to have an alcohol-free pregnancy with full information by choice. They'd have to plan it. It's not actually going to happen without planning it. Um, it needs support, and that's from all of us. It has to be done respectful and sensitive, and as it has been said, not all women will manage this. The lessons from the Canadian Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Awareness Campaigns, their aim is to help people to understand the issue and where to get help. And I noticed that while we were up at 60% drinking, they were down at 10%. So like they have made an awful lot of headway on this. It has to be one component of a broader strategy, and that was made, point was made earlier. Partnerships are key to reach, reach the audience we need to get. Fear-based approaches don't work, and they just cause unnecessary anxiety and distress for the woman. Successful campaigns, they focused on large populations and they were designed for populations at lower risk. So we really need to start speaking to the young people. Um, if we can move on from that. The target audience really are the teenagers before they're sexually active, or youth groups, or schools, or families. We need to start the conversation and really everybody needs to be thinking, how do we plan an alcohol-free pregnancy? We need support of legislation, and I suppose that support of legislation, it has to be enforced. The licensing laws, the underage drinking, I know you're all very active in that area, and that really needs to continue. We need the public health alcohol bill. I just slotted this in here. The transgenerational aspects have been mentioned before, but they could do with. There is a cycle of addiction from generation to generation, and those with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, they're at increased risk of addiction to alcohol themselves. So if we can prevent 
cases of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we can help to break the cycle of addiction from generation to generation. Effective interventions then to, on the prevention of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, this is the approach that they're taking in North America increasingly, right? These parent-child assistance programs. So it involves really slight like community mothers. They enrol a mother, a mother during an alcohol-exposed pregnancy or within six months of giving birth to a baby who's been exposed to alcohol in the womb. It, pro it provides support to the mother and to the target child and they tolerate um, them falling off the wagon. We say at the, very, at the very start they find out if I call to your home and I can't find you, on what bench in what park am I going to find you? It's a wraparound service. It's a three-year program with two visits per month. They tolerate relapse and they start again. There are three objectives mainly. To motivate the women to stop using alcohol. If they can't, to make sure they're taking effective contraception until they can and to try to enrol them in, in alcohol and treatment services. And um, this is just one of them. You can just skip on to the next uh, two slides, maybe. Go on to the next one. So why do women continue to drink during pregnancy? I think the most easiest reason really is that it's habit, it's their normal routine, it's the social norm in Ireland. It's very hard to change your whole life around to ensure an alcohol-free pregnancy if your whole social life involves alcohol. Then what they have found in when they have spoken to birth mothers is um, it might have been an unplanned pregnancy, they weren't aware of the pregnancy, they didn't know the potential for hidden harm, and I think that's a real issue. They got conflicting advice or incorrect advice. They were saying, you know, as you said there, you know, the mother drank and the grandmother drank and they felt their children were fine. They can be pressurised to drink. They can be in a social situation where if they decline an alcoholic drink, it's as good as telling the whole company that they're pregnant. Life is difficult, and I won't go into that. That's already been dealt with by plenty of people. And some women are addicted, and it's not an easy task for them to, to give up alcohol. What are the role of fathers? Do they have a role? Family, friends? Well, you can reduce your drinking and give it up for a time. Plan alcohol-free activities that involve your spouse. Have a new routine. Never press a drink on another. When a host, provide choice. If you're buying the alcoholic drink, also buy non-alcoholic drinks. Support the woman in whatever choice she is making. Life is difficult, and we never know where someone else's foot is pinching. The FASD subgroup, I suppose just to say, we see our role as developing the evidence-based guidance, the leaflets, working with our colleagues then on the needed developments. And Justin would have said this, we need the care pathways for women, we need preconception care, we need screening and brief intervention in pregnancy. Trying to move towards a similar thing such as the Parent Child Assistance Programme here in Ireland. And our role would also be to evaluate the interventions. Our role is not... Um, our role is clearly the prevention of new cases of FASD. It's not the diagnosis of cases, and it's not uh, the care and intervention for cases and families. I could actually finish up at that stage now. I don't really need to go any further.